Hello, hello, hello. Need a little more volume on that. Hello, hello. And let's get some volume down here. Hello, hi, welcome. We have a little bit of a thin crew here today. Um, that's uh, because it's terrible outside. And uh, who likes driving on ice? Certainly not me. Um, so if you're watching from home, no. Oh, you do? <laughs> I was actually thinking about popping some donuts before I got here, but uh, you know, it's, it's for the best not to. Um, anyway, uh, if you're watching from home, I'm glad you're staying safe. Uh, if you're here, thanks for coming. Um, so we will um, just kind of get along with our, our business here. So um, I did get one question um, over email that I thought would be good to sort of um, answer for the entire class. Um, if Phoebe is here, uh, I'm answering your question, uh, although uh, I thought it would benefit everybody to, uh, for me to address this. Um, so uh, the question was about the exams, and uh, it would be a good, t good time for me to tell you that we are having uh, a midterm exam uh, and a final. So I'll start by telling you a little bit about the midterm. You can find the midterm uh, under your home or modules page. It's modules if you're looking from a mobile phone. Uh, the midterm is the Thursday before spring break. And so uh, we have two class days uh, this semester devoted to the midterm and the final. So you can see here the midterm is on March 10th. And uh, it looks like right now it has 19 points. Um, that could change uh, depending on what I get around to covering uh, during our sort of lecture uh, session. So um, when I say it could change, I can guarantee you that there will be between 15 and 20 questions on the midterm. Um, I try not to finalize the midterm until, you know, after I give those lectures um, because I don't want to quiz you or test you on anything that I didn't cover. That would be totally mean, uh, and I would never do that. So um, expect uh, the midterms to probably be finalized um, after I give this lecture on Tuesday. Um, and uh, my prediction is that it will st stay around the 19, 20 questions level. So um, just to give you a couple, a little bit of uh, information about it without sort of um, giving it all away, um, I do a review uh, of the midterm. Um, so I give you a written study guide, and I also do a verbal review in which I basically go through the midterm and kind of tell you what's on it um, so you know where to look and where to study. Um, so that will happen uh, the Tuesday before um, the midterm. If I don't get to do this uh, review in class, um, because we also have a lecture booked that Tuesday, um, I will post the video of me telling you what's on the exam <laughs> shortly after uh, class. Um, and you can catch up with it any time. So, so that's the midterm. It's, uh, like I said, it's between 15 and 20 questions. It, the midterm is all multiple choice. Um, also, uh, you should know about the midterm that you have 24 hours to take the midterm. There's no sort of catch there. There's no sort of secret. You only, you know, you really only have two hours. Like, no, you really have 24 hours to take the exam. Um, so that 24-hour period is midnight uh, of the ninth, which is the night before, midnight the night before, and then you can take it up to midnight of the tenth. Um, and then the period in which you can access the exam closes. If you have um, a special situation like, I don't know, you get sick with COVID or, you know, something like that that's important, um, you could certainly uh, go ahead and uh, ask me to make alternative arrangements for the time that you take the midterm. Um, as long as we resolve it, you know, in a timely manner, uh, I'm totally, totally fine with that. So um, the final um, is, oddly enough, during finals week. Um, this 
is the uh, date of the final exam block during the, you know, the block schedule for exams. Um, if you want to use your final exam block, or whatever time during the day that is to take your exam, be my guest. Um, I will give you 24 hours to take it um, on that day. So, um, yeah, so it's the same situation. It would be midnight uh, the 16th and then uh, midnight on the 17th. You would lose access to that. Um, it looks like right now the final exam is also between 15 and 20 questions. I think that even though it says 15 points, that might be slightly misleading um, because I know that there are several multi-part questions on the final. Uh, so it might actually be closer to 20 questions. Um, also, on the final exam, the final has some short answer questions, uh, whereas the midterm should be entirely multiple choice. Um, the final exam also has, a, it may have an image upload assignment where I ask you to make an image according to a certain set of instructions and then you upload it uh, to satisfy that question. So, um, so yeah, there's a couple of uh, questions that are not multiple choice. Um, just like uh, with the midterm, I do a video uh, review of the final. Um, I would say since the final is not cumulative, the final is basically covering the second half of the semester. Um, one thing that I can say about the midterm and the final is that the midterm, uh, which is, let's see, doo -doo, doo, right here, um, the midterm is basically covering all of the lectures that have power uh, so slides. Um, and then some, you can see on the midterm study guide, uh, there are a couple of additional things that are covered, like resolution and pixel size and some general concepts like that. Um, but by and large, the midterm is really covering this sort of slide lecture content. Um, we do less of the slide lectures as we go into the second half of the semester, so the final will tend to be a little more technical um, and a little more kind of based around some of the software tools that we're using towards the end of the semester. So just kind of a general difference there because we're covering different things in the course. Does anyone else have any questions about the midterm or final? Um, as I said, I'll be reviewing the midterm, hopefully in class, if not shortly after class, on Tuesday the 8th. Yes, hi. Ha ha. Thank you. I remember a student asking me if they could have the date for the final exam, and I was, you know, sitting there at home, and I was like, it's right there. Um, that's wonderful. Thank you for telling me that. <laughs> um, okay, so then that stuff is all up. Um, also, I guess now would probably be a good time to tell you, um, if you haven't been able to see this, wow, that, may, that explains a lot. Um, but uh, I do also, uh, myself and the TAs have a sort of absolute last day to turn in assignments for a grade. Um, and that day is Thursday, May 12th. So that um, includes basically any reason that you might be uh, late or given an extension for an assignment. That is the day when we have to actually see the assignments in order to post your grades to the registrar. That's like the do or die date um, for us. Um, and so uh, it's kind of good to know what that date is, probably. So yes, any other questions about midterms and finals? Yeah. Oh, that's not right. Um, so I will go ahead and set the final date today. Um, because we're working on that final exam block, I have to wait to hear from the registrar when my, when my date is. Um, so I do remember getting an email about that, so I can post it. Thank you. Let's see.
Awesome. So um, yeah, I'll get that posted later today. I'm guessing that it will be somewhere between May 8th and May 13th. I'm pretty sure, by the way, that it's on May, uh, May, t May 11th or May 12th because I scheduled this date after the exam. Any other questions? Comments on my Canvas skills? <laughs> no? OK. Um, all right, well, so that's, um, that's a ways off. So we have some time to sort of like, uh, you know, wait and about freaking out um, until that happens. Um, and then for the midterm, um, obviously, I scheduled it ahead of spring break because I did not want to be cruel. So let's jump in to thinking about GIFs. And, um, you know, last class, we took some time to really uh, think about GIFs uh, and how we can make them. Uh, just to recap, we made a GIF with a photo burst, and then we went and we made a GIF out of just a still image. Um, so, so GIFs are, oh, Biden. Um, GIFs are definitely something that I sort of think about a lot, um, uh, probably for a couple of, uh, couple of reasons, and uh, those reasons are that, you know, you just encounter it an awful lot in your daily life. Um, is there anyone here who doesn't? Well, it doesn't matter. I would be highly surprised if there was someone here who didn't use GIFs um, on their mobile device or, you know, as a way to just communicate information, right? Um, and certainly, you know, the latest distributions of iOS and Android have really made it even easier to send and receive GIFs by sort of integrating them into the text messaging um, app that is part of your phone. So, so what we're sort of thinking about in this course is we're thinking a little bit about those everyday GIFs, um, and we're going to sort of look at them in a kind of academic way and classify them. But we're also thinking about gifts that might be considered like more artful or somehow you know, related to the so-called art world. So um, by the way, study questions, you've seen these several times. Uh, if you're looking for a way to study for the midterm, ta-da. <laughs> Um, they're right here. So um, these questions may or may not uh, bear a striking resemblance to the questions you'll find on the midterm. So um, we're going to be looking at all of these questions. Um, I'm not going to sort of read them out loud, um, but these are all the questions that we're going to be addressing in these slides today. So. Um, we're going to talk a tiny bit about the history of the GIF, and um, you may not realize this, but of all of the file formats that we use in this course, which you could potentially be exposed to probably at least a dozen file formats um, in the different apps that we use, the GIF is actually the oldest um, of all of those file formats. Um, it's even ahead of the JPEG um, in terms of being old, old, old. So. Um, it's so old that I use GIFs in elementary school. That's how old it is. <laughs> um, and uh, basically in the mid-80s, uh, the sort of idea of the GIF was brought forth. And um, GIF was actually made for a, a couple of special purposes. It was made to be compressed. Um, and the reason why it was made to be compressed well, in the 80s, you used to have to connect to the internet with this thing called a phone line. <laughs> and um, you would actually uh, you know, use a dial-up modem. Connections were extremely slow. And so this whole idea of needing to have files, as, particularly graphics files, which tend to be more space-taking, um, that you needed those to be uh, small was definitely one of the one of the things, and so this actual uh, rotating Earth NASA GIF was actually um, sort of branded by a company called CopyServe, which was one of the very first. Um, it was called actually a bulletin board system, which predates the so-called web. Um, but it was a system where you could log in and you could shop, you could read the encyclopedia, you could do some other stuff. 
You could go to very early versions of what people would consider web pages, and um, even though there was no web. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a, a pay for use service. And so this GIF uh, actually um, developed some notoriety and some historical importance because of that. So I want to get this out of the way uh, when we're started talking about GIFs. Um, you may notice that I call it a GIF, despite having a bona fide uh, degrees in um, computer science. Um, <laughs> Uh, why do I call it a GIF? Um, mostly I call it a GIF because I think that's what makes sense to the most uh, people. And um, also I just DGAF um, on, that, on that particular issue. Um, but uh, certainly there are people in the computing community that uh, feel incredibly strongly that uh, GIF is actually a GIF, uh, pronounced as in with, in with a J. Um, and I'm not going to call out people who are in this audience if, if you're one of those people. Um, I think you can pronounce it however you want it and that this debate is ridiculous. Um, but uh, it is really sort of like an absurd, uh, as people have called it, a religious war in geek history. Um, and the reason that this has become such a sort of calling card of whether you're, you know, in or out of some sort of uh, proper nerd nerddom um, is mostly because it's a, it's a way that people can sort of gatekeep who is cool and who has secret knowledge uh, about this thing that everyone else is doing wrong. Um, and so there, it's not just my opinion. You can read about this in many places, like uh, the New York Times. You can read about it. Um, this is the only time in this class I will ever tell you to read about something on Reddit. Um, but <laughs> but if, you, if you do read about it on Reddit, you'll find a lot to, that people have a lot to say <laughs> about it. Um, so. Uh, Basically, the reason this has become such a big deal um, is because the, the creator of the file format himself um, actually clarified at one point in a conference that it was supposed to be pr pronounced GIF. And just to make things even crazier, about 15 years later, this guy changed his mind um, and said, no, no, it's actually GIF. Um, and then, of course, there's the camp of people who think it's GIF because it's actually an acronym for the word graphics. Graphics, not graphics. Um, so, anyway, um, if there were a question on the midterm about what the right way to pronounce it was, by the way, I'm just going to say clearly there is no right and wrong. <laughs> especially when it comes to this. <laughs> okay, so, um, so why is GIF sort of important and why should we care? Why, why is it the way it is? Why has it become such a big deal? Um, well, as I alluded to before, when it was invented, it was invented to provide animation over networks. Um, and so at the time that it was invented, those networks were incredibly slow, and having something move or have frames attached to it well, was kind of a big deal because frames add file space. So um, one of the ways that it compresses, uh, the file format can compress, and we looked at this a little bit in the web exporter last class, um, one of the ways that it can uh, compress is by limiting the color palette. And so that's how you get these sort of like this GIF in the center, these kind of weird, crunchy looking GIFs. Um, and then of course to the side we have some less compressed GIFs. Um, I think Keyboard Cat is sort of inherently compressed. So um, anytime he's remixed like into maybe like a Soviet nuclear, um, you know, uh, control station, um, it, the embracing that sort of artifact is, is usually the direction that people choose to go. Um, the other thing that makes GIF sort of so ubiquitous is that, as I said, it's actually one of the oldest file formats that you'll probably ever use in, in your lifetime. 
Um, the only file format I can think of that we would use in this course that would potentially be older is the TXT uh, file format, which is super old. Um, but uh, because it's so old, um, devices can actually sort of encompass it easily. So y you can have, a, it would be incredibly difficult, I think, to find a device that didn't have the sort of um, programming to interpret and open up a GIF. Um, so, and that goes for, you know, even like more contemporary devices. And then, of course, GIFs are fun. Um, and I think fun is highly underrated on the internet these days. So um, we're going to talk about sort of like some academic subclassifications of GIFs, which, you know, it's what I do for a living. Um, I'm an academic. So it's kind of how we uh, think about these things, how people write about them, and how people even, you know, curate them into history. Um, by the way, if you're looking for a really great uh, collection of gifts that you can see in person, uh, the Computer History Museum in San Jose, California. Amazing. So we're going to talk about all of these different kinds of gifts. So the reaction GIF is probably um, one that, you know, I think we can all probably relate to having used it um, in our personal lives, like on our mobile devices. Um, I'm a big fan of crying baby slamming head on counter. Uh, that's one of my favorites. Um, but uh, the reaction GIF has also sort of been uh, a, a touch point um, for issues about diversity and inclusion and how we sort of see uh, race. And so um, I, would, I could say that I'm you know, talking about this because of Black History Month, but I actually talk about it all the time anyway, um, because it's an important topic. There's been a, a, an awful lot of scholarship recently about reaction gifts uh, being a higher proportion of people of color, um, and just really why, why that is and why that happens, um, and what people are sort of thinking about when they're using those GIFs. Um, and so there's a link to a couple of, um, you know, sort of think pieces about what is now called digital blackface, um, which is basically like co-opting a, a reaction GIF of somebody who is a person of color and uh, using their reaction in a way as a stand-in for your own. Um, and and so it's an, it's an interesting idea, and I think it's something that, you know, bears reflection. Um, if we kind of move on thinking about reaction GIFs, obviously there's lots of reaction GIFs that, GIFs that um, fulfill sort of other, um, other characters. This, this is like my personal favorite of like every damn day. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm, obviously that's not literally every damn day. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, reaction gifts are usually, you know, uh, in a you're in a place where you want to kind of like exaggerate the way you feel and you want to kind of make a point um, to the person that you're sending them to that like you're, um, you know, OMG, like so done or whatever. Um, and so that's kind of the role that, you know, reaction gifts fulfill. Um, there's Certainly, like, because of the ease in which you can make a GIF and um, the sort of quickness of the media cycle in this country, um, we can certainly find uh, GIF as political satire. Um, so, pro you know, within a day of something happening, like a presidential debate or, um, I don't know, something ha important happening in Congress, I can look on Giphy and find, you know, a GIF of Nancy Pelosi doing something ridiculous and send it to my friend. And then, you know, we have this sort of bonding over um, our personal beliefs. So, um, you know, I think that people have made the argument and scholars have made the argument that GIFs about politics have, um, have sort of become so ubiquitous because of the... Uh, quickness of doing it, and also that gifts tend to sort of augment or amplify the sort of tiny gesture 
or the tiny moment. Um, so here's some tiny moments. Um, you know, these are moments that take maybe one or two seconds on screen, but on a GIF, they just go on forever, and they become like really big gestures. Um, so, so they become sort of like sound bites in our, in our culture and in our discourse. Um, of course, I have to say, I finally deleted the Trump uh, slide. I decided it was time. He's actually not the president anymore. Um, so, uh, so that happened. Um, and uh, yeah, this is the new one. So um, I think that, you know, going back like probably 20 years, you can find presidential gifts, um, and they're pretty hilarious. Um, I will say that I think uh, former President Donald Trump uh, provided a very rich uh, sort of like bed of visual information to build gifts um, from. And I think that probably we could point to the fact that he had already been a media celebrity. Um, so not sort of addressing, you know, obviously the numerous uh, political differences between the two presidents, but I will say that I think Donald Trump's gifts are possibly more entertaining um, and uh, because they're more outrageous um, and they have, uh, tend to have a sort of um, really just totally ridiculous quality. Um, where you can see uh, in, in these gifts, you know, there's sort of more state. He's like in a suit, you know, doing presidential things. Um, so there's also this sort of like tradition of using gifts as a way to replay events. Um, and I think we could probably see that intersecting with the politics gifts as well. Like you want to see somebody's side eye or, you know, something that happened on television that was like a tiny little moment. Um, but this also sort of happens in the sports um, arena and in many other, um, many other sort of things. Um, when <laughs> if the uh, figure skating, recent figure skating debacle uh, generated some really tragic gifts. Um, so moving into like the sort of so-called art gif, um, and these are really what I think of these are, are um, that probably one of the defining characteristics of an art gif is that it's not meant to co directly communicate an emotion or directly communicate an, uh, a shared like media experience. Um, you can see in uh, this sort of genre called the cinemagraph, it's basically like a moving still image. Um, so here, you know, you can see it's sort of like a photograph, but it has this um, sort of replaying uh, snow, precipitation, water. Um, in here we have some smoke. Uh, sort of like, usually there's like one or two subtle things happening within the visual frame. Um, and here, this is even more subtle, this sort of fog rolling across the landscape. Of course, one of the things that GIFs have been used for over the years, and this is something that uh, is still continuing today, is for technical illustrations and data visualizations. Um, if you happen to be, do we have any chemists in the house? Yeah, so the ACS uh, journal format now, I know this because my partner's a chemist, the ACS um, will accommodate GIFs now in journal articles, <laughs> which is hilarious. Um, so yeah, you could actually like, you know, publish a paper and have a, an animated GIF sort of riding along with your PDF. Um, and certainly with data visualization, you know, having that element of animation can be really useful for, um, telling sort of, um, you know, an for revealing like an added dimension of the data. So one of my personal sort of favorites um, in terms of art and entertainment gifts would be the infinite loop. Uh, they can be kind of challenging to make, um, but basically uh, you kind of can just get hypnotized by these gifts. 
um, that seem to sort of go on forever. And it's a, it's a technique that sort of transcends subjects. Um, we'll certainly see some sort of arty uh, infinite loop GIFs like this one. Uh, you know, even simple, simple feline GIFs can be infinite looped, and we'll see a few of those as well. Um, so these are sort of interpretations of the classic uh, double face palm meme. Um, this is actually a really well-known uh, um, artist named Marina Abramovic. She has a, a film that you can see on Netflix called The Artist is Present, um, if you're interested in performance art. And then, of course, we have the original sort of referent, which is Captain Jean-Luc Picard. So these are, are some more abstract, uh, hypnotic sort of gifts that just go on and on and on. And of course, as promised, the infinite loop cat gif. This was probably the most disturbing gif that I had seen in a while when I saw it. And of course, um, that guy. Yeah. I wasn't going to speak his name. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's a pretty active debate right now in the art world about whether gifts are art. Um, and I think that one, there's a couple of reasons why that debate is even happening, because I think, of course, you and myself can sort of look at a GIF and say, well, of course it's art. Why, is, why are we even having this conversation? Um, I think that one of the reasons why this debate is happening is because GIFs are difficult to collect. Um, with the emergence of NFTs, um, a lot of GIF artists are now using NFTs as a way to sort of monetize their practice. So prior to NFTs, there wasn't really a way for a gallery to sell a GIF. Um, and so um, we could probably spend like a whole class period talking about NFTs and what they're doing for the art world. Um, if I have time, I would like to do that. Um, but, but I would say, a lot of people, I think, you know, just kind of roll their eyes when they hear about NFTs, but um, for digital media or for things that traditionally existed in a purely digital format, um, they're actually kind of really help helping add a sense of legitimacy to the, to the work. Um, and so, yeah, they're doing some good things. Um, so I'm going to show you a bunch of, like, fine art artists, artists showing in galleries and museums who are making gifts as kind of a primary part of their pract art practice. So Faith Holland is a really uh, big sort of artist, um, and she makes a lot of gifts. Um, she also makes sculptures and installations. And um, a lot of her work has to do with this idea of um, connecting technology to sexuality. So she did these um, series called Visual Orgasms, which were like, um, well, as you can see, sort of like foamy white material, you know, coming out of these uh, champagne bottles. Um, there were also some gifts with like uh, sockets and uh, plugs and, you know, basically like taking these everyday uh, objects and kind of pushing the sexual metaphor. Um, she tends to work a lot with collections of objects and collections of things. Um, so this is a different series where she worked with eyes and paper books. Um, she also has done, uh, as I said, you know, her work is uh, dealing with issues of technology and sexuality. She's also uh, a major theme in her work is about the obsolescence of technology um, and kind of what happens to old technology. So um, this sort of technology at the bottom of the sea is kind of a playful play on that. Um, this is really uh, one of her, uh, one of my favorite pieces of hers. 
um, called Machines of Loving Grace. And here she's got, you know, classic like 90s era um, CRT monitors, all with sort of like, looks like Windows 95 screensavers. And they're sort of just, you know, living out their days with small woodland creatures. Isn't that lovely? Um, so it's just sort of like thinking about, you know, um, where does this stuff go? And of course, the sad answer is it winds up in a landfill, um, further destroying the earth. That's my bummer for the day, I think. Um, so Lorna Mills is another artist that will actually look at some of her stuff directly on Giphy. Um, she works uh, a lot with, uh, again, like kind of collections of things. And so you can find, uh, you know, these works on explosions. And um, she, also, uh, she also deals with um, kind of issues of femaleness and technology and sexuality. Um, it's not so obvious in this work, um, but in some of her other work, you can really see it. Although there are people doing some interesting things in these uh, in these gifts, if you look closely. Um, and then sort of in a totally different sort of stylistic universe, you know, we have people that work completely abstractly. Um, Yuchi Soryoka is um, probably like a person who is working at the intersection of uh, abstraction and then also, you know, having a, some reference to the real world. So it's um, obviously references a QR code here and then, you know, referencing these sort of uh, biomorphic, uh, happy, psychedelic forms. Um, Carla Gannis, uh, another sort of pretty important, like, digital media artist right now, um, she works a lot with issues of how women are represented in the media and through games and um, other things like that. So um, you can see here, you know, every sort of like Wonder Woman iteration of the last 30 years. And, um, and then sort of, you know, thinking about work that might be a little bit more formal or a little more sort of, you know, based on... Um, the technique and how things are being addressed. Um, you have people like David Kobelski, who um, in his real nine to five world, he's actually an animator for a major studio, um, but maintains an art practice to sort of um, deal with some of these, you know, uh, creative impulses and issues. So he tends to deal a lot with like small, small movements being amplified. Um, and then, of course, we uh, also have, you know, s a sort of politically inflected um, GIF artwork um, that, you know, prompts the viewer to sort of think about um, things through text and broad concepts. I leave you with one of my personal favorite uh, GIFs from a long time ago. It seems timely. Putin on the Ritz. Okay. So, um, before we go today, I did want to make sure to show you uh, Giphy.com. So, if you go to Giphy's regular page, um, you will need to uh, upload a, a GIF uh, for your assignment. But also, if you have time, go to the artist's page and uh, take some time to really look at what's out there. Um, you might get inspired um, by what's out there. Here's Lorna Mills. Um, obviously, uh, Dolly Parton and dogs. What, what more do you need? Um, and yeah, you might find some things that um, you know really uh, inspire you. There's a lot of good stuff on, on Giphy's page. So it's a good mix of people who are actually doing the work professionally and people who are sort of doing the work like, like you and me and just kind of uh, randomly uploading their expressions. So any uh, follow-up questions? All right. Um, I think we're going to finish up a couple minutes early today. Um, next class, we're going to get started with video. So that'll be exciting. 
and uh, I will show you how to use Adobe Premiere. Woo! Drive home safe, y'all.